right? And uh, uh, yeah, Nigel, are you able to? There we go, hopefully. Perfect. Hello, Nigel. How are you? Good. And yourself? Thank you for the invitation. That's very, very kind of you. Yeah. yeah, thank you for being with us. You have been quoted quite a quite few times yesterday, even by our first keynote. So, uh, yeah, uh, we're re really looking forward having you speak uh, about uh, to uh, to see if what they say is, is true, right? Uh, and, and, yes, we're really glad to have you for this topic that really interests a lot of people about revitalizing the core uh, with banking as a service. So I invite you to share your screen right now. Sure. Uh, that uh, should share, and I'll just uh, put this into full present mode. And hopefully, you should see something interesting in a few seconds. Yeah, we see the slides. The sound is perfect. Um, I will discuss. I will leave and uh, let you the stage for thirty minutes. Thank you, thank you, Mehdi, and uh, thank you. I, I guess to. Uh, uh, to uh, a friend uh, Simon Redfern, I think he gave introduction last uh, last uh, yesterday at the keynote. Uh, my name is Nigel Verden. For those who don't know, my name is the co-founder of, of Rails Bank, and we're just going to talk through today of the the journey essentially uh, to embedded what we call embedded finance uh, and this opening up uh, of the the banking world. And finance world to APIs very much in the very early days of like people like Richard Stallman in the uh, opening up of the open source world. I think we've now got the opening up of industries uh, driven by that sort of those uh, philosophies and concepts that came out from when, when people like him were at MIT. So uh, just some background on me. I've founded three companies all in the fintech space. Two of them are API led, which is Currency Cloud and Mills Bank. And uh, we got a, a few world firsts uh, through, not just me personally, but I was in the teams who did these, just to be clear. And, and uh, it's all been about opening up. Uh, the first foreign exchange trade we did on the internet was when the internet just appeared. Uh, this is we we had proprietary systems at that time, and it's when we started using open protocols, uh, even for simple things like e email with SMTP and HTTP when it came out, and when Mosaic. For those who are old enough to remember. Um, when Mosaic came out, it was uh, is a, a massive opening up of, of possibilities and, and communication driven by originally the open source movement and also the WW3 uh, with, with open protocols. So open banking is, I still think open banking is something that's uh, it's taking baby steps. Uh, uh, it's primarily driven uh, as a uh, uh, sort of, or perceived to be driven as a compliance and IT thing. Well, personally, and I think many of the other advocates are of, of opening up anything, it's about business model regeneration within finance. I think one of the things that's really struggled with uh, within the uh, uh, to, to get up to uh, start getting onto its feet and, and getting uh, be able to walk nicely and everything else like that as it grows up is uh, the perception in some of the main banks of it being a an IT issue and a compliance issue when it should be front of mind of the board to be a business model. And a transformation issue the same way that in the music industry uh when it went from lps and and tapes for those of you're old enough to remember those to cds that was one transformation that's pretty much where the finance world is and when you then when apple then moved over into the the itunes and created a purely digital product that's where i think open banking has to get to it's still not a digital product but if it is become a digital product uh, you then have to uh, look at the new business models and that's the exciting part. Uh, the iTunes redefined the whole industry. An industry was on its knees before then. So it's created, revitalized the whole uh, music industry because of that one thing. So embedded finance, though, is a, is a bit more there. Uh, and the way we look at it anyway, and, and other colleagues, is uh, there was only two bits of real functionality in open banking, which is uh, account aggregation and, and issuing a, a sort of making a payment initiation. When if you're actually embedding finance and embedding things uh, or people in their own customer experience looking to put finance as a, as a, a new tool in front of their customer uh, for many reasons from either monetizing customers, from uh, gathering data, from financial data so they can see the spending in competitors, etc. You've got to have a, a, a whole, all the different types of services you normally expect to build a financial service so you've got to be able to issue accounts which you, you can't do at open banking at the moment 
uh, I'm sure you will do in the future. So I think the journey for open banking is to to really move towards uh, the a, a much richer set of APIs across all the areas of finance and i'll cover later on uh, the, the sort of ways we we look at bucketing it and grow up to be uh, an athlete like uh, usain bolt uh, from from the baby steps being taken at the moment and there's a ton of great people in the industry and i think they're they're, they're all aligned that way and uh, and uh, supported by lots of business support by governments and supported by uh, the uh, uh, the regulators as well and what i think we have to do is change the dialogue from being a regulatory issue into being a, a an industry transformation issue, and it's further uh, evidence through the uh, the changes I mean uh, put into sort of like the the when COVID's come along, all these digital processes that uh, are so, uh, that have supposedly been tr digitally transformed have actually not been trying They've just taken analog type thinking and analog process and slap a website on it. The process is still analog, and the whole thing about digital. And the open banking movement and open movement is all about removing friction and creating uh, ecosystems that work harmoniously together, and uh, and rather than creating old school analog processes with a bit of a sort of lipstick on them. Uh, so, where this sort of really comes from is, uh, to, well, technology is really democratizing, giving access to many industries. It's the technology is always the enabler of things. Uh, when the wheel was invented, it enabled you to push things further. Uh, but the actual activity behind it was a cart, and uh, so the uh, the cart became useful then. So it's the same thing with Amazon. Uh, Amazon has it's got, it's got a great uh, tech uh, infrastructure, or AWS. It's got it's great tech for its business, but fundamentally it's a warehousing and a uh, logistics fulfillment uh, merchant platform and everything together. The tech just makes it amazing, amazing in customer experience. Because what they've done is totally digitized, made a digital processes, and got rid of all the uh, all the all the friction, etc. And I think that's the way to a embedded finance uh, movement is about removing all the friction of putting financial services in front of customer uh, and making it part of a cohesive experience. And that's what all these companies have done. Twilio is one which I'm sure pretty much everybody in the API world must know. If you don't know them, if you using WhatsApp, it's the one that powers the phone, part of WhatsApp and powers the phone and SMS and a ton of things. And they just took around all the uh, all the, uh, all the the stuff you have to normally deal with all the uh, telco industry, which is uh, fairly old APIs and other bits and pieces. But uh, they just made it, anybody can actually go into being offering telco services super simply. It's a great company. And we'd be the same thing, anybody can be a FinTech as, as if everybody can be a, uh, a what's you call it, a, uh, everybody can be a, a telco. Uh, if you can embed finance into your existing customer experience, uh, you can then create all sorts of new and interesting uh, journeys for your customers and experiences. Uh, on a journey that's already there, food delivery, for example, uh, can you bring? Can you uh, use uh, cards that are that are charged for point of uh, point of pickup, for example, so you don't get fraud into it? Uh, and supermarkets, can you uh, engage people where you can, where you can do uh, basically lending at point of uh, at, at the till, basically at the, at the checkout? Uh, and uh, we're in discussions with a, 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 a property development company that has 80 shopping malls around the world about how do we embed the financial experience within the shopping mall, both the the, the merchant side, uh, the employee side, the the staff. To operate the mall side and the consumers uh, and things, so it's also different movements. And another one that would be, say, something like Lululemon, who has a, a brand of empowerment, empowering women. Well, why can't that brand go into uh, financial empowerment of women as well as also empowerment to exercise? It's it's a way of, of moving into a different product and embedding it. So the and the APIs are the fundamental building blocks. And I don't think I need to tell everybody on on the, this this particular conference. Uh, it's they're just Lego uh, and and designing APIs. We have a, a very much approach of taking human centric design to the API uh, level. So we we don't take it from a technology design perspective. We take it purely from as if it, your your API is your UX. And if you make your UX super simple and your API is super consumable, you've then got the ability to uh, for product managers to think I assemble these blocks and I can build this. Uh, rather than have to figure out how, to, how they technically work together. 
And so that's the, the design principle we took. We took my colleague Nick Bourne and I, who's my CTO at, uh, at the founding CTO at uh, Currency Cloud, uh, and is also our chief architect here at Rails Bank, and is CTO of my very first company that one did we met at uh, on the trading floor at Swiss Bank. Or, uh, his, his, his whole design concepts are all, all about human centric design, all about decoupling, and all those uh, things. So you, it's not about the graphic uh, and the, the uh, what we call the crayons world of making a beautiful uh, experience on a website or an app. It's about the behind the scenes trying to get a great, beautiful experience uh, with well written and well designed and human centric APIs using language that humans understand and then makes it easier to, to, to work with them. The, uh, and then what we see uh, in better finance is really the utility because the, the pain points uh, better finance companies solve is running financial service infrastructure is an actual pain. It's the same with running uh, Amazon when they're running up. Uh, so sort of logistics infrastructure, it's a, it's a pain. Uh, trucks and everything break down and, uh, and things. So it's the same thing in the finance world, uh, connecting up to places like the Bank of England and to Swift and everything. It's like connecting, it's like going back 50 years in technology, but it does actually work uh, once you get it working. Uh, and then it's the operations 24 by seven uh, to make sure it's reliable, up, uh, it's scalable. Uh, it's, uh, you don't get a downtime because money is expected to flow uh, 24 by seven. And so we take the approach that Google and, and others have in the way we build our, our dev teams in, in squads, uh, pretty much continuous releases so of features coming out when needed. So you can run 24 by seven without uh, any sort of major, uh, any sort of the downturn to, to reinstall something or anything. So that, that's a real thing. It's uh, and unfortunately the back ends of this uh, which can be uh, the, let's say, the banks and, uh, and others and legacy does have to have downturn because they're not used to 24 by 7 operation. So that's the, the essentially the arbitrage and, and some of the opportunities to put SLAs on top of that with the with, with platform. That's essentially what we do. And the, the, the ultimate goal of all this is uh, say you've got a brand or a shopping mall or you've got an airport or you've got a, a brand that's a, a supermarket or say a clothing brand. Uh, let them focus on customer experience and user experience and product because uh, there's no need for them to worry about how do you operate financial services. And particularly ourselves is because we, we're, we're also regulated, so we go all the way down the stack into settling and clearing with, uh, with the uh, uh, said Bank of England or Visa or MasterCard, uh, and we, we have all the tech all the way through the stack there. And we can operate it 24 by 7, so we don't have to rely on third parties. Uh, that, uh, so that gives a comfort to uh, uh, the customer to just focus on. That's the power of all APIs is abstracting difficulty and, and mess away from customers so they can do wonderful things. And that's the, the real, uh, and assemble them in different ways so they can fit into their use cases. Uh, in terms of going away from the core, uh, we, we, we wrote a complete uh, uh, core operating system uh, to, uh, from the ground up to run financial services. Uh, and one of the key issues with most core, whether it's core banking, whether it's uh, inequities, uh, listed futures options, credit, uh, sort of, uh, I'm talking about credit in the, uh, in the uh, investment banking world side of things, uh, but even credit in, in banking world, uh, the, the ledgering is tightly coupled into product. And because of that, uh, you end up in a, most financial services organizations with a ton of different ledgers, which all then have to be reconciled uh, to each other. When actually a ledger is the same thing for pretty much every single product, there's a debit and a credit and a running balance. And then you just got to wire things up to those uh, to that ledger and different types of credits and debits. Uh, and that's that's what we call our rails. That's what we call Rails Bank. Our rails are those pieces that you put in the, the banking as a service cars as a service, uh, compliance, all these pieces that you bolt on to our operating system. And our operating system then plugs into the legacy. And so we, we were able to represent pretty much every fungible asset. We have all the transaction processing, state machine, and, and everything on top of that, support a modern banking as a service, cars as a service type, type uh, infrastructure. Uh, and then we have a, a blindingly fast and uh, modern way of doing uh, ledgering on a, on a global basis. Uh, that can support all this and be the books and records uh, that are considered by regulatory business. 
uh, and, and it is our books and records because all our money at the Bank of England is represented through the, the, the OS. The reason we take an OS approach is an OS uh, like on, uh, on, on iOS, uh, you can build stuff on iOS because of the APIs. So essentially the modern financial system should be like an, it is an operating system. There's all the core bits and pieces that went on memory management and stuff like that you'd have in the, in the, in the OS. Uh, you then don't have to worry about it. It's you just run apps. The same thing um, on financial services. So I was asked uh, by the organisers uh, uh, the, the question to, to finish on, which is, where will embedded finance be in ten years? Uh, I, I look at the the world of what we used to call tin uh, and data centres and things, uh, and the world of CRM. Uh, all these businesses on the right, uh, AWS. Google, uh, Microsoft, Alibaba, Ping An, to be honest as well, uh, Salesforce. They're all platform uh, businesses that uh, came from a world of like Salesforce. There's people downloading their competitor, Siebel, and everything, and, and not being able to run a wonderful marketing campaign about no software it's because it was all cloud based. There is Salesforce is a platform. Everybody gets the same features if you pay for them. It's not bespoke, all multi tenanted, et cetera. And AWS, Google, they're, they're all utilities uh, on us. And we, I think uh, uh, there will be a number of utilities uh, in the embedded finance world, uh, very much like there is on the, the infrastructure world. If you say look at embedded finance as the next layer in the stack above uh, the infrastructure players, like AWS, Google, et cetera, uh, that next level up is uh, the money layer and the finance layer. And the embedded finance companies will be those layers. And I can see people like Visa being one of them. I can see something like uh, Ant Financial being one uh, because they've got all the pipes uh, connected up to, especially Visa and MasterCard, connected up to every place in the world. Uh, we could be one of them because we're the first out of the blocks in any uh, global one uh, existence at the moment. Uh, so that's where we see it going very much like the, the world of TIN and uh, data center. We now never have our own kit unless you're in some a, a country that hasn't provisioned yet but uh, it's uh, that's where we we see it going the utility the next layer in the stack which is uh, financial services and uh, any questions I was, I was asked to do 20 minutes and then 10 minutes questions so hopefully ready I've, uh, I've stuck in within your time requirements no, thank you. Thank you very much, Nigel. Uh, we already have two questions from uh, from the chat. Question, uh, actually, from Simon Torrance. Uh, why do you think incumbent leaders today are not appreciating the strategic importance and power of embedded finance? That's a, that's a good question. There's, there's a couple of numbers that support this, uh, and uh, the the uh, the uh, if you look at the boards of the traditional financial services uh, banks, for example, only about 3% of them have actually people who have digital experience. That's number one. Uh, so this comes on the board of what what a digital organization looks like. You, you go and look at the board of Amazon, of Google and a Apple and places that they're, 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 they're not just technical people, they're, they're, they are digital people have understood it. People like Johnny Ives understands very much about what digital really means is about removing friction and reinventing processes uh, so that's one number number two is uh, uh, and this is just my cynical approach okay so so slap me for this one is anybody has to appoint a chief digital officer has lost the game already because that shows you haven't got the mindset of digital in the leadership of the the company so if you want to be a digital to do that as a transformation moment to move the company in a, into a digital mindset, uh, all well and good. But uh, that's another one. So you can tell the companies have made that transition. I don't have a chief digital officer anymore uh, because it's now, it's culturally digital. Uh, Something Kodak made a big mistake at in, in the uh, in the camera world. They were the best innovators in film and uh, photography, and when they when they came out, and then lost that. Uh, innovation and lost that digital mindset. Uh, they still thought of uh, analog. Uh, so I think it's it's a human thing. It is uh, is what will, what will make change rather than technology. The technology is there. I uh, think one other just dynamic, and this is uh, people keep saying oh, compliance is hard. No, compliance isn't hard. Uh, I hate to say that. It, it is. It's a process. It can be localized into there, but. Uh, 
a lot of people in the compliance uh, world within banks still need to understand what digital means because they tend to run by lawyers uh, and people who haven't come from a sort of engineering and other backgrounds. So that's that's another one. Actually, the 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 the, the problem space of, of compliance can be solved, and, and tech is an ideal thing to do. And we do that in the way we uh, do all the transaction monitoring and things. Uh, the final one uh, I'd say is there is one bit that is difficult uh, when you've got uh, something sitting on an IBM 370 or equivalent of or a deck or some of that, and it's been running for years. And it's been running reliably for years uh, and things. And let's put RBS's uh, things aside for a while. Uh, the, uh, uh, that, that changing that, uh, migrating all your uh, services off that, because you'll have 20 years of loan products and regulation embedded in code, which is the problem, rather than, rather than decoupled away from, uh, from the core, uh, is like driving 100 miles an hour and changing the wheels of your car at the same time. Uh, while you're drunk. So it's a highly, highly, highly dangerous thing to do. And so you can see why people are, are doing the, like uh, in, in a, a standard charter building mocks in Hong Kong and others making those sort of a, a totally rebuilding things and ground up and migrating over or taking, Charles Schwab did this as well with uh, his online brokerage. He, he gave his top execs the, uh, the mandate to go uh, eat the lunch of his shopfront brokerage so he could transform the business into a digital mindset. So those are some things to hold it back. I, I think primarily it's not technology, it's, it's, uh, it's mindset, getting people into it. And uh, as I said earlier on, if you looked at uh, open banking, it's still, it's still viewed within, so especially in the UK, uh, as a compliance and IT issue uh, and, and things. And that is 1980s thinking. So that the thinking needs to go forward and, that, and that's cultural. Yeah, this is why we call this conference uh, Embedded Banking, the road from open to embedded, because actually people stay on the open mind and think it's technical, so we agree. So we have quite a lot of questions. Uh, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll try to decompose the questions into global and local. So we'll continue with global questions. How easily, how easily can traditional banks decouple with so many legacy systems, right? What's required for them to get uh, uh, to get to that stage? Sure, I, 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 it's going to be very difficult to decouple. I think the, there's a couple of strategies. One is you, you do have an abstraction layer and you build all new stuff on the abstraction level and gradually uh, switch things off at the back end. Uh, so uh, things like uh, good old MuleSoft, uh, or, or when I was uh, in the day in the in capital markets world, we had a similar, similar issue until everybody has put on bus infrastructures and then you took legacy off and put uh, new stuff on. So there's this transformation technology that you, you can use uh, where it does create a, a middleware layer. And one of the other ones which uh, there's not just legacy, the, the data issue uh, most financial services issue, uh, organizations face that every bank has had for the past 40 years a, a master data project that never seems to finish. So there's, there's, there's data governance things that also need to be fixed before you can migrate and, and have a, a single data model. So it's data, one is having a clear view on, on data on it, and number two is having a transformational technology uh, that allows you to, to replace things as and when, uh, when needed and, and go back in, in case as well, so you can roll back uh, strategy. It's, it's not easy, but... Uh, or they've got the strategy I just mentioned that you, you build from scratch up and, and replace completely like, like Mox uh, and others. But you, that's, that's got a long-term plan. You need a, a strong uh, leadership on the board to actually execute that. So a few questions now more about Rails Bank uh, uh, and your vision uh, there. Um, uh, quick question. Uh, some, uh, is, there an, is there an analogy between Ruby and Rails and Rails Bank, or is it just a naming coincidence? It's a total naming coincidence uh, on that. It's, uh, it's, uh, it is basically, we, uh, we, uh, Currency Cloud was all built on Ruby on Rails. Uh, so it was built on Ruby uh, the, uh, and without the Ruby on Rails part. But it, it's really about the, the Rails uh, open up the west coast of the US and the railways did that. And it's uh, things that connect up uh, and make things uh, uh, enablement uh, with the railway, so it's it's a it's a nod back to engineering because I, I made my co-founder both engineers uh, by trade uh, when we uh, when we left university, 
and things and ended up in finance uh, because they just paid more, I think, at the time. But uh, it's Rails is, is it just an odd old fashioned uh, uh, engineering that uh, is enablement. Rails were enablement technology, and most of us just think of it as a lump of metal. It was enablement technology, which we are. It's funny the Rails metaphor because uh, uh, yesterday Brent from uh, Credit Suisse said that Switzerland is in the center of continental Europe. And as 100 years ago, they made a specific rail to connect the north and the south of Europe. Now they need to make APIs to connect. Uh, let's say the north of European banking and the south of European banking. So funny enough to notice that Rails uh, analogy when it talks when we talk about APIs. Um, we have a we have a question also about like are you planning to become more uh, to become cloud cloud agnostic over time? Uh, that's a good question. We, we're going to have to have parts of us cloud agnostic. Uh, we we heavily rely on parts of AWS. Uh, and I won't go into detail because my CTO will, will shoot me because I'll make a, I'll, I'll make a mistake of telling you the wrong thing. But uh, if you contact the email directly, he can talk you through it. So we're not trying to be closed shop or totally open about uh, our business. Uh, so there's some parts we, we're totally reliant on AWS. Now, in different parts of the world, like Indonesia, Philippines, uh, Vietnam, and others, uh, the, some of the cloud infrastructures don't exist, or there's only one of them. Like in Bahrain, you've, you know, you've got uh, AWS. So we're figuring out how, especially for data residency, how we can have a, a global architecture that has localized uh, processing and, and is cloud agnostic. Uh, and that's the the uh, problem I've given to our, our CTO and engineering team uh, to yeah. figure out. Yeah, we have uh, three questions for two minutes, so let's try, right? Uh, about insurance as a service, uh, will Rails Bank launch its own insurance product or will you connect with external companies? And if yes, if yes, about the connecting, uh, is it how you plan to expand your services by partnership? Yeah, the, that's a good question. I don't think we're going to be a risk carrier uh, in the insurance world. Uh, we'll most likely be a, a, a brokerage type model. Now, we've, we've already made some inroads into that with Singapore Life. And uh, you see where they've launched a, well, our, our clients here in Singapore, also investors, uh, uh, where essentially a uh, a deposit account, so an insurance policy has been made to look like a deposit account. Because if you look at how you run a balance sheet within within both organizations, it's, it's the same asset liability management issue behind the scenes. And it's just the tech has enabled that. And so by removing certain features of a uh, of a uh, of an insurance policy like redemption restrictions, you immediately get a deposit account which put liquidity into it. And so uh, some of those innovations we would be the broker of, uh, it's unlikely we'll be a risk carrier uh, for insurance at the moment. And we don't yep. have plans either. Yep, so uh, banks can embed things, uh, embed Rails Bank into their system, but uh, at some point, you know, uh, companies like Rails Bank can also embed other systems in their yeah. even more. Well, la last question from uh, Mirage. Uh, how can technology democratize the banking and financial industry in the future? Do you have any prediction? So maybe you talk about APIs, but do you see other technologies coming, uh, you know, to uh, to democratize sure. the banking and finance? Yeah, I, I see uh, 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 the structure of the industry changing. Uh, the the banking industry has a major issue in what's called a cost income ratios, and, and that's killing their share prices for what what they actually should be. And part of that is the the cost infrastructure they have, like the the CAC cost, customer acquisition cost is about three fifty dollars, and the lifetime value of a non lending, non credit based uh, customer is about two fifty. So you lose money on every customer, uh, and also their loan origination uh, is highly expensive. So if uh, we can uh, restructure the industry where fintechs who are great at originating customers, and 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 also origin and know their customers incredibly well. And you got the uh, say loan origination cost and deposit origination cost of ten bucks each or less. Uh, then uh, and the banks uh, are then able to service those loans because they uh, and they have the infrastructure, they have the data, and they they've been doing lending since they started. By definition, that's what a bank is. It uh, turns deposits into loans. Uh, then we've got a, a structure that can work, but. It does mean that part of the bank becomes uh, essentially a, a wholesaler. Uh, but I think if, uh, if for example, I, if you're a fintech company and you said your deposits were held at, uh, at HSBC, 
uh, I'm sure your consumers would be very very happy about that uh, rather than some uh, somebody they've never heard of. And so I think that you can create an industry that is restructured to look at part wholesaling. Some of the banks become like an AWS, uh, but well, part of AWS essentially. And then fintech, people like ourselves on, on top of that, distributing it and making it available. And then fintechs and other uh, brands and, and people sitting further on top. So that, that's where I see more as a, a layering and a, a restructuring of, of the industry. Yeah. Thank you very much, Nigel. Uh, that was great. A lot of questions happening. We're out of time, but thank you very much for uh, for this. Yeah. Uh, uh, so yes, and, and I think someone of your team uh, pushed a link about if you want to follow what World Bank is doing. So don't hesitate to uh, to connect to that link to all attendees and uh, follow what World Bank is doing. Thank you very much, Nigel. Have a great thank evening. You. you too. Bye. Bye.